Good morning, family. I will read for you from the Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparation that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary had chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. This is the word of God. Good morning again. First thing I want to do this morning is really thank all of you. Uh, a few weeks ago, we got to thank you into a little video camera. But it's just not the same as looking you all in the eye and saying thank you so much for your prayers and your support of our family um, these last six years in South Sudan. And it is really exciting what God is doing there. And we know that so much of the fruit that we're seeing is because of your prayers. We literally feel them. So thank you. Uh, secondly, I want to really thank the building committee because, and all of you, really, who have donated so generously to make this project possible, I was gobsmacked on Tuesday hearing what God has done uh, through the building committee and through this church. And on behalf of all the young families who are going to be, uh, you know, be able to build on that foundation for generations to come, thank you so much. Thank you, Floyd. You've poured your heart and soul into this. Thank you, Roger. Thank you to any other building committee members and to all of you who have given. We're so grateful. All right. So thank you, Isitara, for reading so beautifully this morning from Luke. Did anyone else hear that story and feel sorry for Martha? <laughs> I do. Every time I read that, I feel sorry for Martha. And honestly, I think a big part of it, <laughs> you just need to sit at Jesus' feet. <laughs> no, I, th I think a big part of why I feel so sorry for her is because I relate. It's because so much of the time I am just like Martha. When our family six years ago moved from New Zealand to rural Africa, one of the biggest adjustments for me was the pace of life. In the West, we hurry, right? We are about productivity, efficiency, punctuality. How can we get more done in less time? But it turns out no one in Africa is in a hurry. I remember not long after we arrived getting uh, a letter summoning me to an emergency health meeting that was going to start the next morning at 9am sharp, it said. Well, first of all, it wasn't an emergency. It was the routine health meeting, but they forgot to tell people. So they said, let's just call it an emergency. Secondly, there was nothing sharp about the starting time. I hurried that morning. I gobbled down my breakfast. I ran over and did ward round before devotion. I got to devotion late. Then I rushed off from devotion early and I arrived at nine on the dot. I need to find nobody at all was there. And I asked the security guard, you know, where is everyone? I'll be banned. I'll be banned. He said, they're coming. Don't worry. Um, so I went and sat down under a tree and prayed. No, I didn't pray. I thought of all the patients I had to see and all the things that I had to do. And it Five past ten, nobody. Ten past, twenty past. 
Half past nine, I, oh, half past nine, sorry. Half past nine, I got my phone out and called the organizer. Ah, I'm here. Where are you guys? Oh, we're just on the way, he says. And an hour later, they started to trickle in. We did a little greeting. How are you? How's your wife? How's your children? How's your, how's your people over there in the Netherlands? People think I'm from the Netherlands. They can't believe there's an island called New Zealand or two. Um, yeah, how's your, you know, how's your cows? How's your garden? How's your goats? How's your chickens? This, this is real greeting. Finally, we get to the end of greeting and we're ready to start. No, we're not. Because we haven't taken tea. You can't do anything until you've had tea, right? So we take tea and eventually we do have the meeting. Eventually I get back and see all the patients and everything works out fine. But I got robbed of so much of the goodness that God had for me that day because I'd allowed hurry to become so deeply ingrained in my life. Can't you just hear the words of Jesus to me that day? Jono, Jono, you're in such a hurry. But only one thing is really important. Come and sit with me. Now, I was at this point going to invite anyone else who needs to slow down a bit to come on a mission trip to Africa. But at the building meeting on Tuesday, I heard there's a much quicker and, and cheaper way. You can join Floyd and the building team working on consents. <laughs> 18 months, oh my gosh, you guys are champions. So am I alone or does anyone else feel hurried sometimes? Yes, there's a few honest people. Um, hurry can be defined as acting urgently due to the feeling of having too much to do and not enough time. The reality is that our society is in a hurry and it is really hard not to get sucked into that. But hurrying brings us far more harm than we realize. It affects our body, bodies. Stress raises our heart rate, our blood pressure, our blood sugar, our blood cholesterol, all of which leads to a high risk of heart attack and stroke. It also lowers our immune system. It precipitates autoimmune diseases and many other effects on our body. Hurry affects our souls. It results in high levels of anxiety less self-awareness. It causes us to hide from our problems and we lack the inner peace that God desires for us. But by far the most disastrous effects of hurry on our society are spiritual. When we hurry through life, we can end up being just too busy for God. Like Martha, not you Martha, like the Martha from our story today, we can end up becoming distracted from Jesus and his continual presence with us. Dallas Willard, the famous theologian and philosopher, said the greatest enemy to spiritual growth in our generation is busyness. Author John Ortberg said it like this, I cannot be present in the kingdom of God and have a hurried spirit at the same time. And my favourite is from Cory Ten Boom. If the enemy can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. How true is that? In South Sudan, I've seen Satan attack people through witchcraft and through curses and demon possession. But I wonder if a lot of the time here, spiritual attack looks more like hurry and distraction. Another text or Facebook message pinging on our phone. Another hour watching the TV show we love. Spending evenings online shopping for things we don't really need. None of these things are wrong in themselves. But if we're not careful, then like Martha, we can become distracted from the one thing that is really important. But Jesus is inviting us to a different way of life. Not to run away from the busy world and hide in the mountains like monks, but to enjoy God's inner peace right in the middle of this world of hurry. Jesus' invitation in Matthew eleven thirty eight is for all of us. 
come to me and I will give you rest. But how you ask? Good question. Today I want to share three habits or practices from the life of Jesus that help us to enjoy God's rest in the midst of this world of chaos. The first one sounds really obvious, but for me at least it's been really hard to do. It's slowing down. Slowing down as a way of life. Question, how many times do you read in the Gospels that Jesus was in a hurry? Never, right? Jesus worked really hard. He worked really long hours. Jesus was the most wanted man on the face of the earth. He ministered to thousands and thousands of people. But he was never in a hurry. And he was the Prince of Peace. Jesus didn't run. He walked. Because God is love. And love and hurry, they're like oil and water. They just don't mix. A few years into our time in South Sudan, we were absolutely exhausted. Seeing patients from morning to evening, on call every night, on call every weekend, lines of people um, lining up to tell us about their tragic circumstances, hot weather, sick kids, all the rest of it, you know. And in the midst of this chaos, I remember God saying something to me which he's repeated many times since, and which I often, almost every day, repeat to myself. He said, I want you to slow down and love. Slow down and love. It's only when we slow down that God's love is able to soak deep inside of us and change us into the people of love that he is calling us to be. That's how we become people of love. Psalm 46 verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am love. Be still and know that I love you. Be still and know that I love that really annoying person at work. (laughs) In a world that values productivity and efficiency, slowing down can be really hard. For me, it's a quest I'm on, a gradual process. And honestly, I feel far closer to the start line than to the finish. But I'm passionate about letting God slowly slow me down Because the more I study the life of Jesus and the more that I talk to God about it, the more I'm convinced that slowing down is essential to living the life of love and rest that God has called us to. In my life, slowing down has involved simplifying my schedule. It's involved saying no to things, minimizing the time I spend on my phone or in front of TV, Do you know the average New Zealander spends two hours and 55 minutes a day in front of the TV? It's involved being early instead of of late to minimise hurry. It's involved building margin into my life so I'm not rushing between activities. But slowing down is even more about slowing down our soul than our schedule. That's why Jesus could work so hard and yet be the most calm, peaceful person that has ever walked the earth. For me, slowing my soul has meant taking a few deep breaths when I start to feel hurried and whispering to myself, slow down and love. It's meant becoming a little less obsessed with my to-do list, trying to constantly surrender my circumstances to God so I'm not feeling the pressure of trying to make things happen. A few decades ago, there was a famous study performed on Princeton theological students. These are super smart, super passionate Christians. And they all had to prepare a sermon on the Good Samaritan. 
They prepared it in one room, and then they had to walk through a narrow alleyway to the church to deliver the sermon. But the catch was there was an actor in the alleyway, and he was lying on the ground, coughing and groaning, clearly in need of help. The participants were broken up into three groups. The first group were told, you're in a hurry, you're late, go as quickly as you can. The second group were told, you're on time, but walk over there, walk over there now. And the third group was told, hey, you're early, but you might as well go and settle yourself in. Only 10% of the budding pastors who were in the hurry group who were on their way to preach about the Good Samaritan, actually stopped to help the person in need. The rest walked right on by. But those who weren't in a hurry, the, weren't in the hurried group, the majority of them did stop. All of these people loved and valued God and helping people. All of them were about to preach on this very topic of stopping for the one, but those in a hurry stepped over the person in need because their hurry distracted them. The take-home point of the study was that we can have certain values and priorities in life, but hurrying clouds our vision. Hurry distracts us from what is really important. We simply cannot love and be in a hurry. The second point from the life of Jesus is solitude. In Luke 5 15 we read that Jesus often went away to lonely places to be with the Father. Sometimes we read of him spending whole nights in prayer. Other times we read he got up while it was still dark. But all of the Gospels emphasize the priority that Jesus placed on spending time alone with God to be refreshed physically, emotionally, and spiritually, to be the man, to become the man of love that God wanted him to be. If Jesus had to spend time alone with the Father every day, how much more do we? My testimony for time alone with God is that this has absolutely changed my life more than anything else at all. When Desk and I got married, we decided that God was our absolute first priority. So we would honour him with the first hour of every day, no matter what. And at first it was really hard and to be honest, uh, some days playing miserable. I'd wake up with a brain fuzz, I'd be distracted, daydreaming. I'd get to the end and I'd be kind of relieved that the hour was over. But as my body got used and mind got used to getting up early, as it became a habit in my life, I started to enjoy it more and more. And it quickly became the most enjoyable hour of my day. And when kids came along, even more so. I'm pretty sure that without these daily times of encouragement, we wouldn't still be in South Sudan. So why is solitude so important? Well, firstly, that is where we experience the love of God personally. Paul's desire for the Ephesians was that they may know the love of God that surpasses knowledge. It's in the quiet of solitude that we lay ourselves bare before the Lord in our brokenness and our sinfulness, and we experience the love of our compassionate Father who loves us just as we are. A quote from one of my uh, mentors in life, John Mark Comer. The biggest reason that we as followers of Christ do not experience God's love more is because we're too busy and distracted to sit with God in silence and solitude. Psalm 23 verse 2 is a verse I'm reading every day at the moment. And it says, He invites me to rest in His luxurious love. Who wants to rest in God's luxurious love? Yeah, me too. Um, can we do it for a moment? <laughs> if you feel comfortable, close your eyes. 
Let's just take some deep breaths and just imagine yourself in an ocean of God's love. Everything is calm. He's smiling at us, delighting in us. Okay, some of you are thinking, oh, you can w- wake up now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but isn't that beautiful? Like, to just have that moment where you just feel God's love just flowing over you. I know some of you are thinking right now, Johnny needs to see a doctor. <laughs> I'll see my wife. Um, but listen to what David, the warrior, the giant slayer, said in Psalm 27 4. One thing I ask of you, God, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord. It's in solitude that we experience God's love and beauty, but so much more. I'd love to hear from some of you what are benefits that you've enjoyed of being in solitude, being alone with Jesus. Oh, you enjoyed the peace and quiet of lockdown. Awesome. Healing. Thank you. That was the next on my list. The reality is we live in a broken world. And we hurt each other sometimes. Sometimes we even feel hurt because we feel like maybe God's let us down. And it's only in that quiet place of solitude that God can begin the slow healing work in our souls. Thank you, Davina. So much happens in the secret place. We get clarity and perspective of what's really important. I remember so many times that I've been frustrated or upset about something, and then I've gone and sat with God and talked to Him about it, and He's just said, I love you. And suddenly that thing I was so worked up about is just, doesn't even matter anymore. We become friends with God. My worst nightmare in life is to pour my life out in ministry and then get to the end of my life and Jesus say, but I never knew you. It's in the solitude, the secret place that we build friendship with God. When we're alone with God, we receive his power. We fight temptation. Where did Jesus fight the devil? In the wilderness. That's where we're convicted of sin. That's where we surrender and give things over to God. Where did Jesus surrender his life to God? In the garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, Lord, but yours. It's in the quiet place that we hear God's voice leading us and guiding us. According to Jesus, sitting at his feet and spending time alone with him is not just important. It's the single most important thing we can do with our time. There's absolutely nothing in our schedules more important than being with Jesus. Let's go back to today's reading and the Passion. Luke 10, 41 to 42. The Lord answered her, Martha, my beloved Martha, why are you so upset and troubled, pulled away by these distractions? Are they really that important? Mary has discovered the one thing that is most important by choosing to sit at my feet. She is undistracted and I won't take this privilege away from her. Martha was being pulled away from Jesus by many distractions, and I think that is a big reason why we sometimes find it hard to make time for God. We have an enemy who more than anything wants to keep us away from God's presence. Like Corey Ten Boom said, if the enemy can't make us sin, he'll make us busy. And I wonder as well if sometimes... When we feel that God is distant, it could be that he's actually sitting and waiting. But we are too busy to slow down and spend time sitting with him. I've heard it said in parenting books that kids spell love, T-I-M-E, time. 
And I think it's pretty true. And I think that Jesus was telling Martha that spending time with him is his love language. It's the way he wants to be loved even more than the things we do for him. Time alone with God can be the last thing we try and squeeze into our already jam-packed days. Or it can be the first thing that we book in and are absolutely uncompromising on. The last practice from the life of Jesus that I want to talk about this morning is Christ mindfulness. Now, mindfulness is currently the biggest buzz in psychology. It can be defined as being fully aware of yourself and surroundings. And there are thousands of research articles coming out now about the benefits of mindfulness. Improved concentration, improved relationship skills, reduced anxiety, greater life satisfaction. But what is crazy is that these guys are teaching it like it's new. And it's not. Jesus taught it more than 2,000 years ago. In Matthew 6, 34, in the, mes- in the message translation, Jesus says, Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't be worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. The only difference between what Jesus taught and what psychologists are teaching us is they're trying to take out the best part, which is, of course, God. Giving our entire attention to what God is doing in the moment allows us to enjoy a heart connection with God right throughout the day. When we practice Jesus' original version of mindfulness, Every moment of the day becomes an opportunity to see him at work, connect our heart with his, and join him in what he's doing. I've been trying to put this into practice for about a month now, and I'm finding it such a powerful tool for me in learning to abide with Christ. Whether it's looking out of the car and delighting in God's creation, or appreciating God for the noisy chaos at my dinner table every night, Or, seeing God's awesomeness in my wife's beautiful smile. Every day is full of opportunities for connecting our heart with God. So in summary, I believe we need to be on our guard against hurry and distraction robbing us of what is really important in life. God's plan for us is not to abandon our jobs and our families and run away and become monks. No, it's to enjoy his inner peace right here in the middle of this world of chaos. So for those of you who, like me, feel hurried sometimes, my hope is that you'll join me in my quest to slow down. This afternoon or evening, I encourage us all to take the opportunity to turn off our phones, turn off our TVs, and sit with Jesus. Let's take a fresh look at our schedules and plan together with God how we can make more space for Him in our days. And tomorrow when the busyness of Monday comes, let's be on the lookout for moments to enjoy and appreciate our God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you created us to be human beings, not human doings, Lord. That first and foremost, you created us for love, to love us and for us to love you back. We just pray that as your family, Lord, that you would help us, Holy Spirit, to be able to slow down and choose you, and make you our first priority. Lord, I just pray for a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit, your spirit of peace and love upon every one of us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.